do, we thank you. We love your presence. We honor you. In this meeting this morning, we honor your name. We honor your presence. We honor your presence in one another. We thank you for what you do, how you transform lives and change us into your image and likeness. We bless you, Father. We worship you. And Father, we ask that you would send again now your Holy Spirit, your anointing upon us so that our hearts would be transformed. We thank you, Lord, you, you, you desire us to hear you and know you in our hearts, not just our heads. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today what I want to talk about is um, Jesus and the angels and the role they play in creation and in the life of the church. Um, last week at the meeting here, I had f- four people I know separately had an experience of angels coming into the, the building. Um, one was when we were singing, I think, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the song. Um, it was one of the last songs, but someone, four, I had, anyway, four separate people, so I thought, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> I thought I might just have a little look at that um, and see, you know, you know what, where it is in the scripture. So the first part of the talk, I'm just going to put a little bit, centre it on Christ, and then look a little bit about angels, and then I'm going to give some testimonies. Now this talk's been compiled by lots and lots and lots of sources. Some of them I'll mention. Um, at the end, I'm going to read some really good testimonies from. There's many testimonies you could read, and if I ask people here their experience of angels. Neil's got a really good story, if you want to talk to Neil. Um, there's many w- people would have here had some encounter with some angelic visitation, whether it's a protection or whatever would have happened. And there's many stories in the history of the church. And the scriptures are full of them. Um, uh, angels visiting, bringing the word of the Lord, uh, leading people, guiding people. Um, but... So what I want to look at is first that, and then these read these testimonies. Now, these testimonies are, are modern ones. They're from Randy Clark, um, who, by the way, Randy Clark is at our Share the Holy Spirit conference this year, which was quite a, a miracle that we got him. So when I mean he's here, he's not here physically. He's doing a pre-record, but what he asked could he do after the pre-record, he asked could he come on the screen live to minister to us. So it's a real, it's quite a privilege because... I wrote to him uh, a year, and I hadn't heard anything from a year, and then out of the blue he wrote back and said, have you heard from me yet? <laughs> so I said, no, no. So, so, so I'm just going to read some testimony. He's got this book called Open Heaven, and it's his experience, how the Lord led him in ministry in this way. So firstly, I just want to look at the scripture from Colossians uh, 1, 15 to 20. It's where Paul talks about Jesus being the centre of all of creation. Now when you're talking about angelic, beings or whatever, it's very important that we centre it on Christ, that Christ is the centre. We chase after Jesus, not angels or anything like that. So that's really important. And this scripture is, um, it's, it's a wonderful scripture. So I'm just going to read it and then just make a little bit of a commentary about it and then we'll go on. So it says this, in verse 15 it says, so it's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him... By Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers or authorities, all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Everything is for Christ, centred on Christ. Everything is drawn towards Christ in the whole universe. Whether we know it or not, everything is centred for the purpose of Christ, to receive from him. This is what the scriptures pointing to. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, which we're a part of. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in him he might have the supremacy. Now it's interesting, Christ has the fullness 
in him, but we're part of his body. So we participate in the fullness of God. It's extraordinary scripture. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So in this, uh, if we we first look at verse 16, it it says the the words here, thrones, dominions, principalities and authorities. So these are, are various names for classes of angels. No distinction here is made between the blessed angels that... Uh, or demonic spirits, since Paul's point is that Christ reigns supreme over the entire host of good and evil spirits. He is everything, Lord of everything, Jesus. So what we see here in the scripture, what it shows us is that Jesus coming to us takes on this particular role. He comes as our saviour. So the core of Jesus' action is contained within the mystery of his life, his death and his resurrection. Through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, Jesus reconciles all things in heaven and on earth to God. So in the context of Jesus reconciling us to God, something happens to us. We're more than just fleshly creatures. We've been ennobled. We've been elevated to participate in the life of heaven, of God. By virtue of what Jesus has done, he's elevated us to this place, a spiritual place where we can be called sons and daughters of God. He's ennobled us. We participate in his life. And Jesus has reconciled us to the Father. It's good news, isn't it? It's good news what Jesus has done for us at the cross. So the role of every creature then is dependent upon this understanding that Christ is the centre of everything and that all of creation, all of creation finds its fulfilment in Jesus. Everything finds its life in Jesus. So if we see this in the light of Christ being the centre, we can see God's plan who created everything for Jesus in the expectation of him. So everyone is created to receive Jesus personally and come into the fullness of God. Amen? Everyone's created for Jesus. Everyone finds their fullness in the Son of God, in Jesus, what he has come to do as his role as saviour to bring us into this life of God. So now we can see in that context and in this scripture, you can draw this parallel. Now we can see clearly the action of the enemy, Satan, the tempter, the accuser, because Jesus comes as saviour. So now we see the role of the accuser, Satan, uh, by means of his temptation. Evil, pain, sickness, death come into the world because of the fall. And it's in this context that we are able to see God's restoration plan in Christ, which is accomplished at the cost of his blood, that Jesus has come to shatter the reign of Satan and establish the kingdom of God. And in establishing the kingdom of God, this is where he ennobles us. He elevates us into this place where we partake in his nature and we become his children. So we're more, again, we're more than just, you know, the flesh and blood we see. We're elevated to this place to become adopted children of God. So Jesus shatters the reign of Satan and his desire is, Jesus' desire is to establish the kingdom of God in our midst, so to establish his reign, his rule in, you know, um, the midst of his people. So this shows us the important role that we have to play with the Holy Spirit in establishing the kingdom of God in the world, centred around Christ, for it's only in Jesus that all does all of creation come into right order. So it's as we come into right order with God, as God establishes right order in us, establishing the kingdom of God, then corporately what happens is the kingdom of God is established through his people. Now Ephesians 1.20 to verse 21, it's similar to the scripture I read in Colossians, but it says this, it says, when God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority and dominion 
and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So in this verse 21, we see uh, rulers, authorities and powers. Now, these are names uh, given in both Jewish literature and Christian tradition to different choirs or orders of angels that we see that Paul's talking about in Ephesians. So they can, again, refer to the blessed angels or the demons who fell from their rank. And we see this in a number of references, a number of scriptural references in the New Testament, which I won't go into. But if we think of the visible world, like if we wake up today, it's a beautiful day outside, and we see the visible world we live in, we know very little about it. You know, I think I've seen a thing where scientists are still looking at, you know, they haven't understood the depths of the ocean or, you know, how... It's, I think they've only mapped 10% of the oceans or something ridiculous. And then you talk about the cosmos, the universe, which is just beyond our thinking. So we know very little about the, the known world that we see. Having said that, we know even less of this invisible world, the spiritual realm. That's why in some ways, uh, particularly in our secular culture, it's easier to dismiss the existence of the spiritual world than to understand it. And in some ways, as Christians, we can do this too. But when we deny the existence of the spiritual world, we can, however, unwittingly deny God's wisdom and power. And this is what we should always try to caution against because God's trying to reveal himself to us through the kingdom of God. And he's trying to reveal what he's like. As we sang in that last song, that line, tell me who I am. It's an incredible verse. Uh, you know, who we are as God's children. The majesty, the perfect order and precise end with which God created everything, is, it's absolutely inconceivable to our human minds. If the spiritual order is astounding, what should we say then about the spiritual order? The same God who created countless stars and galaxies with marvellous order and astounding laws uses the same unlimited power and wisdom to create myriads upon myriads of angels, the celestial spirits, the heavenly spirits. The Bible describes nine choirs of angels and the early church fathers wrote a lot about this um, and studied a lot about it. Theologians have traditionally recognised that their nine choirs of angels arranged in three levels of hierarchies. So the first consists, and this you see this in um, Isaiah 6, the first consists is a seraphim. The word seraphim means burning one. Uh, the cherubims and thrones. The second, the middle, you can think of the middle order, they're like middle management. Uh, they're dominions, authorities and powers. And then there's a the third level, rulers, archangels and common angels. And these are the ones that interact generally. Generally we see in the scriptures, this, this third order are the general interaction you see in the scriptures with, with us. Um, angels are classified in order according to their divine given task. So they, they, they come to do what the Father, what God wants them to do in context of uh, his will. So through it all, even among these celestial spirits, there's such order and hierarchy and fine intelligence that just to think about it causes amazement at the greatness of God. They're just incredible, incredibly powerful um, what they can do and what they do do. And in, in some sense, you know the scripture, I think it's in uh, Psalm 8, it says, you know, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. The angels are astounded at that, that, that God gave such dignity to us. Because the material world to them, couldn't, they couldn't make sense of it because they're spirits. But now by our soul and our, our spirit and our body, we make the, the natural world make sense because it has a spiritual um, place in the whole of creation. And Jesus became like us is absolutely astounding. It's total humility that he lowered himself to become like a creation so less than the angels, as the scripture says. So scripture tells us too uh, that from the beginning, and these I'm just sort of 
uh, you know, passing over these things. There's so much. You could do days and days and days and days of research and understanding of all these things. In Jewish literature too, I was reading some stuff in Jewish literature. They have different understandings of the choirs of angels. But Scripture tells us that from the beginning of our lives until the end, we're all surrounded by the watchful care and protection of angels. And again, there's a number of Scriptures we could look at, but I won't this morning. The Scriptures teach us, and this is really important in, in the concept of this, the Scripture teach us that, that um, all of God's creation is ordered for the praise of God. Now, if you want to get a key how to come into the presence of God, it's praise, as Joe read from Psalm 9. Because all of creation has been ordered for the praise and the glory of God. And this is what elevates us from our fleshly existence and elevates us into the spiritual realm. It's praise. It's a gift that God's given all His creatures. And I heard a story where a man was taken to heaven and I don't know how true this story is, but when he was taken to heaven, what happened was he heard the church on earth worshipping and the Lord said to all the angels, stop and listen. Because he said, in my presence, it's easy to worship God, but the humans, when they worship, they have to offer a sacrifice of praise because of their fallenness. And all of heaven listens to the praises of God's people on earth. And this is what all of creation, if you think of it like that, all of creation, everything has been ordered for the glory and praise of God. And that's what God called us to do firstly. We were priests firstly of God's creation. We were created to offer all of creation back to God in praise and worship. Now this is where you see the activity of angels happen because as we come into the presence of God and as we worship, they come in and move in to do what God has asked them to do on our behalf. So it's in giving ourselves in praise to God that we find that our lives are more than just natural. They've been, they're spiritual. Again, we've been ennobled. We, we participate in the life of God, which we have again this morning when we worship God. We participate in his life. God fills us with himself. So I'm finishing this first section. I just want to look briefly then at the dignity that God gave us, which again is sort of what I've just said. But if you think of the mystery of creation of the material world, so you think of all the galaxies, the universe, the natural world we live in. If you think of the mystery of it, um, it's incredible in itself because what it does, it reveals the glory and praise of God. Many of you, you know, you would have went somewhere, maybe in the Blue Mountains somewhere or on the beach and you look out and you're just awed by God's creation. And it does reveal to you something of the mystery and the power and the wisdom of God. But this is the incredible thing. The incredible thing is that its full meaning is fulfilled only in the creation of us, men and women. It only makes sense in both the natural order and the spiritual order. It's only through men and women that the entire creation to which we belong is united with God because we unite this world with God. (laughs) It's extraordinary. We're so broken and weak, but heaven stops when we worship because we offer a sacrifice. We offer a sacrifice to God. The whole ordered universe of creation only makes sense in the context of him creating you and me. Because we're both flesh and blood and we're both spiritual. We have a spiritual soul that unites these two worlds together. And when we worship and praise God, when we serve God, what happens is we bring heaven now to earth and we bring right order to creation. And remember, as I said at the start, Jesus is above everything higher than everything. When we worship God, what happens? The kingdom of darkness is shattered. And God's kingdom is established in the earth through his church. Satan's rule, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, is broken. 
And now the church has been commissioned to continue the work that Jesus started. And praise, in offering a sacrifice of praise in our lives, it shatters the kingdom, the dominion of darkness, and Jesus' kingdom reigns. So it's only through men and women that the entire creation of the material world we belong to is united with God. So it's through Christ, through um, what he's done in us, that this creation makes sense. Now, having said this, I just want to come to the second part of the talk and I just want to talk, uh, give a couple of testimonies now about angels. And this is from a book I read. I'm basically going to read to you uh, from this book from Randy Clark. And it's, a, it's called Open Heaven, if you wanted to read it. And what happened was he went to this uh, famous evangelist he knew from Argentina and he asked him why he's seen so six, much success in his ministry over the years. And this man said to him, he said, you know, he said, I don't understand you Americans. He said, you, you talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, about the gifts of the Spirit, about um, miracles, all these things. And he said, but you never talk about angels. And it really puzzled Randy, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you when I read, because I'm going to read firstly the start, how he sort of started to see it. It unsettled him because he, he didn't like the, to think that, you know, about angels and how they work. Because, anyway, I'll read. I'll basically, I'll read from what he said. But there was a couple of things. There was this, this contact he had with this man, and then he read this book from um, a man named William Brennan, who was a famous evangelist, a book on the supernatural. So I'll read. Randy talked about how his eyes were being opened to ministry of angels. He said previously there was just no room for it in his theology. To me, it was something on the peripheral. Did I say it right? On the peripheral. He said, I didn't want any intermediaries between God and me. He said, as I started reading the Bible, and because I was thinking about this, because of the conversations he had and the, and the book he'd been reading, he said, I was seeing things that previously I had overlooked in the scriptures. And don't we all do that, don't we? He said, my problem was that if I have the Holy Spirit, why do I need angels? Have you ever thought about that? If you have the Holy Spirit, why do you even need an angelic visitation? Or in intervention, sorry, not visitation, intervention. He said, in my Bible reading, I reached some familiar portions of Scripture about Jesus' life. After he was baptised in the Jordan River and received the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. After that time, the Father sent angels to strengthen him. Who? He says, Jesus. Here's a man who was the eternal Son of God, became flesh, full of the Holy Spirit, born of the Spirit and conceived of the Holy Spirit. If there was ever anyone who was perfectly living in the Spirit, it was Jesus, the Son of God. Yet the Bible says Jesus was strengthened by angels. He said, this got my curiosity up. I began to think there is something wrong here. If even the Son of God had angels come and help him, wouldn't I need angels to come and help me? Who do I think I am? And then he goes through a number of quotes in the scriptures, you know, where Peter was led out of prison by an angel, um, Philip, Enoch, uh, an angel, the angel of the Lord came to him. Um, John was taken, you know, uh, had revela in Re Revelations we see angels have come to him. It's right through both, he goes through like the New Testament quotes of different ones where there's a lot of uh, angels working in the life of the early church. And then he, then he comes to this. He said, Then I remember back in 1994, during uh, the first few weeks of the outpouring in Toronto revival, a young girl named Heather, 14 years of age, came to me for prayer. She was severe dyslexic and reading at second grade level in the eighth grade. I prayed for her and she was out under the power of the Holy Spirit for about 45 minutes or longer. During this time, she had a vision where the girl came... where the, when the girl came to, she said, I think I need help for dyslexic brain reading. <laughs> I might need this. if it, I, I'll, I'll give you the end of it. Okay. During this time, she had a vision where the, 
when the girl came to you, she had seen herself being operated on by an angel who rewired her head. Now, don't we need that? Shaka da ba ba. I need that. I might need that. Um, her, her mother and father were pastors in a vineyard in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and their career before pastoring was mental health professionals. She asked her mother for a book. Previously, she could hardly do math at all, and it was very hard for her to read. She, she then began to read the book so easily it clicked. Something had been rewired in her head. Some years later, she gave this testimony at one of his healing schools. She graduated fifth in her high school class and she was also healed of allergies and some other things. Now, that's a good story, but this gets better. Heather's best friend, Monica, was also dyslexic. When Heather returned home from being healed, she went up to Monica and said, Monica, Jesus is going to heal you. She didn't tell Monica about her healing. She just prayed for her friend. Sometime later, Monica said, I had a vision. I saw an angel come and rewire my head. Monica was also healed of dyslexia. Later, the girls realised that they both had the same vision that happened. So this is sort of sparking his interest. Now, this is the second testimony, and I've sort of like tried to put a couple of testimonies to one to make it coherent. But I do have a little bit of dyslexia, right? So if it doesn't make sense, you can blame. But I just want to preface this one from a scripture from Hebrews, Hebrews 1.7. And, and there's no numerous scriptures you can use, but this is one we know um, in speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. Now, if you do a search, you'll see a lot of times there's a manifestation, if it's manifestation in the natural, there's wind or fire sometimes with the presence of angels. Um, there's there's um, countless, you know, there's many testimonies uh, for this, and, and we remember the scripture that's in Hebrews 1 7, and then we've got Hebrews 1 14. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to help those who will inherit salvation? So they're there for us to bring us into what God wants for us. Now he says this he says, One night we had to go to Manus, and I'm pretty sure this is in Brazil, meeting in a church of about 21,000 at the time, but which was now about 60,000 members. My friend Gary Oates was teaching. Now, this is a bit of a radical story, this one. Gary had an experience where he was in a meeting and he was taken out of his body, so he went into like a trance and ultimately he met the Lord. And he, he makes the point uh, that Gary was this non-mystical type of guy lying on the floor. There he was weeping. Gary is an organiser and he likes to stay in control, but God apprehended him that night. Following that time, he said, he began to see angels. He has this gift, and that's interesting, because this gift happens to him every once in a while, while, while he can see what is happening in the spirit realm. So he, he went to a meeting, uh, the Holy Spirit touched him, and all of a sudden he was, his eyes were open to things. And that comes back every now and then. So, and then Randy goes on to say this, he'd never fallen down while teaching, which I hope I don't today, but he says, but as he was teaching, I saw his eyes roll up and he fell down. I thought, he's in trouble. <laughs> he's on the floor and his mic is still on. He said, I knew God was up to something. Gary's wife had also gotten drunk in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was moving there. She was drunk and her eyes were open too to the spiritual world, what realm. Anyway, I said, Kathy, go and get the mic and take over. Kathy got up there and she is very prophetic. What happened was Gary saw a 15-foot angel come right down the middle aisle and he was overwhelmed by it. So Kathy got up and did the most bizarre thing. Kathy grabbed the mic and she started prophesying to the wind. I mean, she literally prophesied to the wind and the wind started blowing inside the building. It blew so hard that it blew the three back rows of chairs over. It came up and we had a huge prop of door on the platform, about two inches thick, so big, sounds like a fire door, about 50 millimetres thick. And the door was blown open and the wind was not blowing outside the building. Earlier in the series of meetings, we had been doing what we do every night, asking people. So Randy Clark has these healing meetings. And what he does, he asks people, are you 80% healed? If you are, wave two hands over your head because of the largeness of the congregation. <clears throat> and he says, we were seeing about 500 to 800 people healed 
over the night. <clears throat> um, 500, 800 people a night were getting healed. This was about only 10% of the crowd of five to 8,000 a night. The last night we had over 10,000 people. Gary came up to me. I'd been encouraging him to tell me what he was seeing. He said, Randy, there's some warrior angels here in this place tonight. I said, how do you know? They are warrior angels. How do you know the difference between what kind of angels they are? He said, I, he said all I know is that they're, they're dressed like gladiators and they have swords. He said, where are they? Randy asked him, where are they? He said, they're over in the balcony on the beam. I said, what are they doing? He said, they're standing like guards. And Randy said, okay, keep me posted <laughs> if anything happens. So Randy was just ministering in um, the meeting. And then as he was ministering, a little bit later, he gets a tap <laughs> from Gary again, this non-mystical type of guy, right? So uh, he comes to him and says, the warrior angels are on the move. I said, what are they doing? He said, they're clearing out the heavens. So they started moving in the meeting. He said there's these black blotches like demonic stuff and they are literally running away. They are, he has the enemy on the run. Heaven is getting cleared out tonight. Heaven is getting opened. So Randy said at this point, I know some of you hearing this must be saying this teaching is very weird, right? He's really off and it's getting pretty far out. You may, might be asking, how do you know that it was really God? Well, I think I would have the same questions if I were hearing somebody's subjective story. However, <clears throat> I would think this could be a matter I would think this could be a matter of imagination except for the fruit of what happened that night. He said that night it wasn't 500 or 800 people that got healed. That night 9,000 out of the 10,000 people were waving their hands had received some healing in their body. He said the difference between that night and other nights was a visitation, the open heaven. To me, that is evidence that something was taking place in their midst. So it's amazing, <clears throat> amazing stories of what <clears throat> God has done and what God is, was, was doing. And um, he goes on to write, you know, again, he didn't have a theology for it. He didn't understand it. But he started to see God move in this way when they were, they were meeting. And again, some people had this experience last Sunday we're here. So try to, trying to land all this, how does it all work out practically for us or how does it work, you know, in us? Now just um, while we're here, the Holy Spirit's touching people, some people. Or, <laughs> or God's doing something. So just be open to the Holy Spirit if he moves in any way on us because this is what we're trying to open ourselves to God. So how do we do it? The important thing is in all this, again, is we, we, we're chasing after Jesus. We're, Jesus is the centre of everything. He's the one we worship. Remember, the important part is that all of creation is ordered for the praise of God, for the glory of God. And that's why, again, praise, thanksgiving is so important in spite of even what we feel, in spite of our circumstances, because it does, it breaks us through into this heavenly reality. And what's also important is because God's created us to be able to have an immediate relationship with him, this made, which I said before, this made the entire material world we live in meaningful. How? Again, by using it to praise God, to praise the creator. It's the highest thing we can do it. it. enables us to be his children. God created us to order all of creation to the praise of God, joining heaven and earth. But there's a scripture I just felt, and this is what I felt the Lord wanted to minister to out of all this, is, is simply this. This is what I, basically why I felt to do the talk. I just felt there's, so, there's people... All of us in some way, we're in a battle, aren't we? We're in a battle. And there's some of you have been battling hard. And I really felt the Holy Spirit wanted to bring his peace on us. And peace, as you know, is the word shalom. But it doesn't just mean peace. It means, you know, freedom from conflict. It means wholeness. It means all these things. And I felt the Holy Spirit wanted to minister the peace of God to people, particularly those that have been struggling in battle particularly where there's fear and anxiety. 
that the Lord wants to bring supernatural peace. And God wants us to see, see, God wants us to see from our hearts. A lot of times we get caught in our heads trying to understand God where our reason is good, but it gathers food for the soul to wait on God and to receive his life in us. And then we understand by revelation it flows into our mind. We can unpack it. But God wants to, to receive him firstly in our hearts. Romans 5.5 5 tells us the Holy Spirit is poured into our hearts. He renews our hearts and then the mind's enlightened with the truth. A lot of times what we try to do is you go the other way. We try to enlighten the mind thinking that we're uh, thinking that the, the spiritual life will just come alongside that and somehow that'll be a part of our spiritual life. But it's not the case. God wants us to encounter him in our hearts. He wants us to, to open our, um, our hearts to see. And it's very childlike. It's being very childlike, just asking the Holy Spirit to open us up to him and then receiving him. Now, there's a scripture, and I just might ask the worship to come up and we'll do, because I want to praise, praise God in this, really worship the Lord. And there's a scripture that you'd know, and it's in 2 Kings 16, uh, 2 Kings 6.15, and it's this. And it's when the whole city was under siege and Elijah's servant came to him and said, look at all the chariots around us. And again, this is about our eyes being open. And seeing what God has for us. And verse 17 says this, And Elijah prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And this is what I feel like the Lord wants to do with us. He wants to open our eyes so that we can see what God is doing in the earth at this time. Now, this may be personal, the battles we face, but it's also what God is doing in the earth. We can miss it because we're caught in our fleshly nature. And praise opens this up. Revelation opens us up. God wants us to see. Elijah prayed. He said, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots and the fire, uh, chariots of fire, there's fire, all around Elijah. 